Welcome to Law Subscribed. This is your dedicated news source for all things subscriptions in the law. My name is Matthew Kerbis. I'm the subscription attorney, and I believe subscriptions can help bridge the access to justice gap and incentivize attorneys to modernize and scale their practice like never before. In this episode, I interview Owen McGran. Owen is the founder of Seed Council, McGran Law, and Purely Estates. Like me, he uses subscriptions and can't just focus on a single business. Speaking with Owen was a relief because the two of us independently reached very similar conclusions on how to run a healthy law firm for ourselves and for our clients. Owen still provides his unique insights into using subscriptions for legal services that are definitely worth a listen. Thank you to my sponsors, 650 and Gavel. Links to both in the show notes, more on them later. And remember to use the code LAWSUBSCRIBED when signing up. It lets them know you found out about them from the podcast. You get 10% off and it really supports the show. I'd love to hear about your experience using my sponsors. Please email me your comments at kerbis at lawsubscribe.com. For subscriptionseminar.com, I'm taking firms off the wait list one at a time in the order they signed up. So sign up now to get your spot in line. I'm an active participant in the process of helping you use the subscription model so I can only work with so many at a time. Thank you for your patience. Another way to help this show is to share it with someone you know. This podcast is for educational and entertainment purposes only and nothing said is legal, ethical, or financial advice. Without further delay, here's the episode. Owen McGran, I'm so happy to have you on the Law Subscribe podcast. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's wonderful to be here. So I've, uh, we were connected on LinkedIn, and you, like me, are a, I, I've been called a micro-influencer in LinkedIn in the legal space. So I think we fall into that similar category. Not not to pat myself on the back, I've, you're, you're a much more frequent poster than I am. So when I saw you post about Seed Council, I thought I had to have you on the show. But just in case my listeners aren't already following your thought leadership on LinkedIn, link to your LinkedIn in the show notes, go ahead and give yourself a little introduction to my listeners. Sure. So micro-influencer is a much nicer way of referring to, to what I do than most people refer. Pain in the ass, you know, I won't shut up. You know, stuff like that is, is commonly showing up in my <laughs> direct messages. But yeah, no, I, I'm Owen McGran. I post six days a week on LinkedIn, mostly because my wife got tired of hearing me say the same things over and over again, and I had to get them out somewhere, right? So I, I run two law firms, one of which is branded in two different ways, which means that I am a little over, all over the map. You probably won't be shocked to hear that I have ADHD. So I, I have a business firm is branded both as McGrand Law, which was my, the initial firm that I opened. And I recently launched Seed Council, which is a, it's exclusively subscription designed for startups and early stage businesses. And then also with Wendy Witt, I own a uh, estates firm. So we do estate planning, probate, and elder law. That's not subscription, but it is all flat fee. So I don't keep a single point one ever anymore because life is too short to track of it like that. I I hundred percent agree. Kudos to abandoning the billable hour for I, I've though for, you know for our listeners who are still using it and wanting to get there. What was like that tipping point? Like what was your origin of the thought process of I can't be billing time anymore if you ever even had to. Yeah. So I, I, I did for the first eight years of my career, I was in medium and, and big law firms doing complex commercial litigation, helping, you know, fortune 100 companies slap fight each other. And, you know, it, it, it occurred to me pretty early on that I just wasn't very good at keeping track of my time. And as the years went on, you know, I would have that panic end of the month trying to recreate, you know, 30 days of, of billable time and, and, you know, I mean, anxiety attack. I realized later on that this was a function of my ADHD and I'm time blind, right? So I could be, I could spend five minutes or I could spend five hours doing something and it would seem like the same to me, right? So it's not uncommon that I'll be sitting working on something and my wife will come down and say, Hey, are you ever going to come to bed? So what is it? Dinner time? She says, it's two 30 in the morning. So th this whole notion of keeping track of my time was alien to the way that my brain works to begin with. Um, and when I broke away and started my own firm, I, you know, I, I initially tried to recreate what I knew. Right. And then about a year into it, I realized nobody's making me keep track of my time. There's got to be another way to do this. You know, we're, we are one of the few industries that, that attempts to do this along with what, you know, CPAs and advertising and, and various other service-based industries. 
Um, and so I started experimenting with flat fees and, you know, uh, ran into a bunch of folks on, on LinkedIn that made me realize that I wasn't totally crazy, or at least not for those reasons, crazy. And we were off to the races from there. I can take this in so many different directions, but, but I'm interested in the, and I don't know, is ADHD, would you consider yourself or have you talked to a doctor about it being like neurodiverse? Does that, does that fall under that? that, Right. I think it does. It is. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, and, and while I've, I've never been formally diagnosed with any official neurodiverse term, I, I certainly find myself in a similar category. I'm, I, you know, similar in that regard, though I don't have a specific, like, it's ADHD or something else. So I, I, I wonder, and there's even an attorney I know who's out there who's an, an, another influencer, although she has more capital I influencer. I don't think she has the micro who, like, she likes it's all about lawyers and neurodiversity. And I wonder if the billable hour just simply doesn't work for neurodiverse attorneys. No, I mean, that is definitely the case, you know, and there is a, there's a reason that so many neurodiverse attorneys have difficulty in more structured billable hour firms, right? And it's, it's not because they're not smart. It's not because they don't know how to do the work. It's not because they don't show up and work hard. It's because the, the sort of structures that are built around the, the, the industry don't match with the way that neurodiverse brains work. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, unfortunately it's, it's the case that, you know, I once made the mistake of going to then the, the lead partner of the uh, litigation group that I was in. And I, I told him that I had ADHD and his response was, oh, great. Do I need to hire you a mother now? Right. So, you know, revealing the, the fact that, that you have a diagnosis and that there are certain accommodations that might, you know, help you survive in an environment like that doesn't always it's not always met with the kind of i mean it's it's one of those things where you know it, it's an open secret in our field that um even though we are the people that people come to to help them with employment law issues we are the most toxic employment situations on the face of the earth right, right. so yeah I, I was just having a conversation with my mentee who's looking to i i should say i have several mentees so if anyone thinks they know one of my mentees I have several. Right, right. right. <laughs> Plausible viability here. Right. Through different different organizations, through bar associations, through the legal mentor network, through all different places. But one of my mentees was thinking about changing firms. And I mean, I'm a solo. And so I was and I started my own only 14 months ago at the time of recording. So I'm I'm telling her, hey, you might as well go start your own firm. Here's all the resources that I just used mm-hmm. a little over a year ago because working for lawyers sucks. It really it's does. Terrible. We yeah. are awful employers. <laughs> We are. We're not trained to to run businesses. We are so focused on practicing law that we don't do all of the things that, you know, help grow people and then put them in positions to succeed or, you know, notice that other people, you know, are going through anything or have feelings or, you know, I mean, you can fill in the blanks from there. Right. But yeah, it's not a good situation. So Owen, then where did you go to learn like the business stuff? Was it just trial and error? A, a lot of it was me falling on my face again and again and again and really, okay, don't do it that way, you know, but some of it was, you know, sitting down and talking with friends of mine who own their own businesses or clients of mine, right? I, I work with startups, right? And, you know, some small businesses. And so I would sit down with them, you know, not only to talk about their their legal questions, but to talk, okay, so so why why do you have your product positioned like this, right? And start thinking about the the aspects of running a business that lawyers don't typically think about, right? Because most lawyers are really terrible business people. And then obviously I'm a lawyer, so I read a bunch of books, right? And, and did all that kind of stuff. But, you know, a lot of it was trial and error, figuring out what worked for me. And, you know, just as important as learning what, do, what doesn't work for you individually, so... Yeah. And, and clients, if you happen to represent business owners, I mean, clients is an interesting starting point. I, I, well, I didn't think of it that way until you just mentioned it. I mean, I learned about Stripe, which powers my payment processing through a client. And I mean, it was years and years ago, you know, way before I even thought about starting my own firm, but like, that was how I learned about it was through a client. So I mean, how receptive were your clients? Like, like, did your clients know what you were doing or was it, was it sort of as wrapped up as part of like the legal services you're providing? So, so, I mean, part of it, both yes and no, right? Yeah. So part, sometimes I, I would be totally frank and say, I I love what you're doing here. Can you talk me through what the thought process was for how you got here? Right? 
and that did serve two purposes. One, it helped me with my business, but you know, you work with companies, the better you understand their business, the better you can advise them, right? So, you know, getting a sense and a pulse for how their business really runs and why it runs the way it does, you know, made me a better attorney for them. And when you're not billing your time, they're willing to have a conversation with you. Yes, exactly. Right. You know, it's funny how that works. Which, which brings me to, to my next question about what your clients have thought about it. So I guess leading into that, though, how long have you been using some form of the subscription model? And then what have your clients thought so far? Yes. Yeah, so I, I've been using subscription models for a little over a year now. So similar as me. Yeah. Yeah. You know, before that, I had moved to, to flat fees, you know, for most everything. I, I haven't tracked billable time for two and a half years now. But, you know, it, it's been a progression from, you know, thinking about what what I'm selling, right? When when it's flat fees, you're selling a package or a product of something and and the results, the the outcomes from that, which is a good step forward from the billable hour, so long as, you know, you, you don't calculate your pricing in terms of, well, it would take I mean, on average this much time because that's just billable hours and drag. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, you know, I wonder because we've been doing it similar time and presumably we both did research before we launched our own model. We were probably researching around the same time. And part of the reason I started this podcast was like, there were not a lot of resources. There's maybe a couple of ABA journal articles yeah. and you found, you were able to find Kim Bennett, who's of course been on the show. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think Jess Birkin did like one YouTube interview that was out there and she's yeah. been on the show too. But other than that, I mean, were you able to like, what, what did you find? Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I, when I first started thinking about subscriptions, you know, my first instinct was, you know, the, the, the bar and the disciplinary committee Thanks. probably have no idea what to do with this. Right. So my, my first instinct was how do I make sure I don't get disbarred? Right. Yeah. You know, and, and partially, partially that's just my own cynicism about the, the, the state of, of how we are regulated which might be an entirely different podcast. So I won't go down that particular rabbit hole. But, you know, it, it, that, that got me thinking about things in terms of with subscriptions. You know, I always bill at the end of the month as opposed to at the beginning of the month because then it's four services rendered for that month and everybody agrees to it and they sign off on it and stuff like that. But a lot of it was, you know, thinking in terms of, you know, I had clients who were SaaS companies, right? And, you know, I saw the the sort of even keeled or far more even keeled run of, of revenue for them, you know, and I mean, you've owned a business now, the, the boom and bust cycle of, of a small business is, is rough, right? And, you know, some months you're like, this is going to be awesome forever. And then the next month you're thinking, am I going to be able to pay my mortgage? And the subscription model jumped out to me as, okay, here's a way that we can get at least a baseline of, of predictable revenue. So that I can better, you know, figure out my operational expenses and, and, you know, actually budget, right. Which is part, partially what I now sell the clients, right. You can budget for legal, you know, yeah, which... I mean, startups, businesses are already paying subscriptions for everything else. For so, everything else. Right. I mean, that's the way of the world now. Yeah. I mean, except for maybe like Amazon web services, because isn't that a usage based thing? <laughs> it still? is usage based. Yeah. So like, that's the one exception is like, is Amazon Web Services and lawyers. Everything else is on a subscription. Even even your employees, you pay them on a subscription usually. That's right. Right. That's yeah. right. That's right. Yeah. Uh, end end of the month billing. That's a first. So, have you considered like opening up an IALTA and putting it in in the front of the month and then transferring it? I I have, but I I hate IALTA not accounting. Right. So, part of the reason I do it this way is you know, I'm billing for services already rendered so it can go directly into the operating account as opposed to an IOLTA. Right. So, you know, you know, I, I don't mind, you know, waiting, you know, 30 days to get that initial payment. What, what so. if, what if they don't use the subscription benefits? Do you still get to charge that? Or is it the access to the subscription benefits? That's it, the it, value. It, it, it's the access. And mm -hmm. at the end of the month, when you bill them for that, they are signing off saying that they, they used it and they agree to the the billing right so right. it's it's it, from my reading of the ethics opinions at least in pennsylvania where i am you can get yourself into trouble by putting you know a un, unrealized fee right into your operating account ahead of doing the work hmm. but 
you know, if you've already done the work, you've made yourself available. I mean, one of the things that, that I offer through my uh, subscription is you can schedule a meeting with me anytime you want. Mm-hmm. Right? You, there's a form you go to, you can get on my calendar within 24 hours. That requires me to make sure that I'm available, you know, to meet with somebody within 24 hours. So, you know, un- under, under the rules, you know, having that availability is meaning that I'm not doing work for other people. Right. And so that qualifies as services rendered. Right. I, 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 Illinois is very similar, although less, yeah. less restrictive on that, that transfer, you know, mm-hmm. I- I issue. Like you can agree ahead of time to like the, the earned fee, as long yeah. as it is actually an earned fee and is reasonable. Right. I mean, like there's right. so aspects you, of that. You, right. You, you can in Pennsylvania too, but the, I mean, I maybe shouldn't say this out loud, but the, the disciplinary board here is a little old fashioned. So I just didn't want to. <laughs> I have to imagine, I have to imagine they are in most places. Like I'd, I'd, I'd be curious for the American Bar Association to do a study on that. What's the average age and factor in length of practice? Because sometimes, you know, age is not a factor or, in that. For, or more. Right. And as important, what kind of firms do they come from? <laughs> right. So, so the ABA, at the time of recording, the ABA recently released that new publication or new opinion on yeah. the ethics of, of fees, right? And, and so I was reading that and I'm like, well, I don't, I think this is right. I also think this doesn't affect how I practice law whatsoever because it doesn't even contemplate recurring fixed fees, which is what right. the subscription model is. And so, so I don't think that changes the way we practice, but I certainly did look up the members of that commission or committee. I mean, and I, you know, none of them, I don't think we're small firm attorneys. I may be, nope. I may, if I, I may be wrong on that, somebody let me know. I'm happy to correct myself, but you know, they you know, they've all, it was, everything was as though people bill time mm-hmm. or are litigators. Right. Well, I mean, it's, it's the default, right? That's what people understand. And most of the people who are on those committees don't own a business. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, so I'm. I do the same thing with 24 hours and which this is, this is what's fascinating. This is what I love about having people on the show and like not doing a pre-show long conversation yeah. is, is things like this come out. We're like, okay, I think I'm onto something and hopefully yeah. you feel the same way. If two yeah. people individually did their research, launched around the same time, are both in that fractional general counsel thing and we both let people book within 24 hours. Now, my, my question for you is like, how do you manage that? Because you, you said, and like me, your website has a, the first button as you click, is, is click to schedule a call. Right. I do the same thing as well. So it's another thing that we independently came to the same decision. So how do you manage the whole, I'm available 24 hours before? Like, how do you not overbook yourself? Yeah. So, you know, a lot of it is, you know, I, I pretty carefully manage my schedule as far as making sure that I have time that's set aside that people can book into and reserving enough time for me to actually do, you know, work, you know, putting yeah. together a shareholder agreement or whatever it might be. What, what I found and what gave me some confidence in, in doing it this way, I don't know if you know John Tobin. Council He's, for Creators, right? Exactly, exactly. I, I spoke with him earlier this year, and he does the same kind of thing where he, was, he gives unlimited monthly calls. And I was like, unlimited kind of makes me a little nervous. He goes, here's the thing, though, Owen. Your clients run businesses. They've got a lot of stuff going on. They're not going to call you up to be your friend, right? They're going to call up when there is an issue, right? When they have something that they need to talk about. And he said, most of the time, you know, you're, you're going to wish that they called more as opposed to just being, you know, worried about whether or not you would have enough time to, to service all the calls. And I found that to be the case. You know, people call when something important is going on. Or when they have a question or they're not sure about something, but they're not going to call up and say, so what's going on this weekend? And you mentioned scheduled call and you could see if if somebody were to go to your website, you could see the workflows there. So like this gets into the technology part. So the subscriptions that power your subscription and just your practice in general, like what technology are you using to implement, whether it's payment processing, scheduling, calendaring, practice management, drafting that agreement, are you using automation? Like what's all the stuff you're using? Yeah, so I, I rely a lot on technology and, and I mean, I'm sure you do too, because when you are building a, a firm that's based on, you know, a relatively low cost access point, you need to be really efficient, right? So I, I run a lot of, of the firm through Lawmatics, um, which, which I love. And then 
I have the the membership portal for Seed Council run through Mighty Network. So there's a whole back end with a knowledge base. There, there are communities where all the members get to talk to each other, ask questions, you know, learn from each other. There's, you know, videos of, uh, you know, here's what you need to think about when you're hiring your first employee and should it be an employee? Should it be a 1099? And how are you going to screw yourself if you misclassify a 1099 person and, and all, all that kind of stuff? The, the payment processing for the subscription itself is done through Stripe. Although previously I've been using LawPay. I am looking for ways to, you know, and, and this is, this is one of those places where my ADHD gets into trouble because I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to buy the API to, to GBT4 and I'm going to build out AI automations, for this, right? And I have to stop myself and say, okay, maybe in a little bit, but why don't you make sure that this just works on a basic level before you start jumping into stuff like that? Yeah, I, I I wonder if you come across another term. It's called multi potentialite. Exactly, exactly. Yes. Yeah, so. yeah. Generalist, jack of all trades, master of some. Uh huh. Polymath. Yep. Although that one's a little highfalutin, but you know. Yeah, that, yes, you know. So I I I I get interested and bored both very easily. So, you know, I part part of the reason that you know I. I I'm running C council the way that I am right now is to to really get proof of concept and and get it down to something that that I know really works. So two things you said low access point. So I'm curious about you don't have to say what your pricing is though. I, it is available on your yep. website. So you're one of the ten of us that put pricing on websites. Yep. yep. Lauren Lester, another one who comes to mind. So so that that may change. I mean, market conditions change. So we don't have to talk mm -hmm. about the specific prices, but I do want to know why you chose what you chose. And then the second thing is then we'll get into seed council and we'll talk about why that's different from your other pricing on your, for your, your main law firm. Sure. So, so the, the, the main law for McGrand law, the subscriptions that I run there are more involved. Those are effectively me stepping in as an outside general counsel. You know, I, I will sit on, you know, executive committees and, you know, go to meetings and, and things like that, basically become a part of the company. Because that involves a significantly larger time investment, both in terms of, you know, actually being in meetings and, and stuff like, you know, the, the price point for that is significantly higher. The thing though, is I don't have necessarily standard pricing for that. What I do is I sit down with a, with a potential client or customer and I'll say, Let, let's talk about what you need me to do. And we'll negotiate a price. There's a month to month thing, so they can cancel any time. I can cancel any time. And what I encourage them to do and encourage me to do is, you know, anytime one of us feels like we're not getting value, we just raise our hand and say, hey, we should talk about the pricing. We all have very, very well tuned senses of fairness. Usually, uh, you know whether you're getting more out of the deal than somebody else. Now, imagine going to one of your customers and saying, hey, I think I'm charging you too much. Should we talk about the the pricing, right? I've done that a couple of times because I was charging too much. You, you gain a lot of loyalty that way because they know that you're there working with them rather than trying to extract money from them. So, you know, the those level of subscriptions... You know, I think the the lowest one I have is about eight hundred dollars, and and I have some upwards of seventy five hundred per month. But yet, Seed Council has chosen Seed to go even, even more accessible pricing. So Seed Council is a different beast entirely. So part of what I started seeing with startups, true startups, is you know a real need for you know business counsel, whether it's purely law or, you know, you know, more business related, but startups are really priced out of that kind of relationship. And so I started thinking, you know, there's gotta be a way to provide enough help. That's not, you know, like maximum amount of help, but enough that gets them through what they need to. And then, you know, build on top of that basis of subscription, you know, if you want to, form, you know, a, a Delaware C Corp, that's an extra 
that's a package that you can buy on top of the subscription. But the the base of subscriptions come at $150 a month and $295 a month. The pricing is just high enough that it, it discourages companies that are just sort of playing. But it's low enough that there's really not a whole lot of excuse for, you know, a company being saying, you know, less than $3,000 a month or a year, rather. We can't afford that. It's like, well, okay, maybe that's the case, but, you know, you've got some work to do then to, to really consider yourself a viable company. Yeah. Yeah. So some, I know you're like seed council is very new. Like you're doing like a limited sign up, right? Like yeah. this just to get yeah. started. What now a lot of, a lot of startups when they're doing like early beta testing, will have like a limited sign up. Like, is that where you got that idea from? What made you want to do the limited sign up? Yeah. So I, that, that's exactly where it came from. You know, I was reading books on lean design, right. Mm -hmm. For, you know, for software engineering and, and things like that. I really, I, I've seen it with clients where, you know, it's really important to get it out to people who actually use it so that you get good data as far as what people want, what they use, what they think is useless. I could spend a huge amount of time putting together an offering, right? Be really proud of it. And it would be something that's perfect for me. And then I let it out into the world and people are like, this is useless. I was like, you seem like a nice guy, but I'm, I'm never going to use, you know, whatever thing I put together. So instead of guessing at what people want, you know, I did something that was distinctly uncomfortable and, and really something that wasn't even remotely close to being finished. And the deal that I have with the, the folks in the subscription is they know that they're there to help build, mm -hmm. right? They know that it's not finished. They know that, you know, as, as the longer they stick around, the more build out, the more information, the, the more valuable the subscription will become. But what's in it for them is, you know, if they say it'd be really useful if we had this, I'm going to build it. Right. Whereas in a year from now, when things are more built out, it's going to be less likely that I'm going to have either the, the capacity or the desire to do bespoke things for a subscription where you pay $150 a month. Right. When I went solo, I pivoted from mostly litigation to a transactional only practice. I did not have a database of documents to automate. That's why a business and employment legal document database and automation tool like 650 is super useful. I can rely on the quality of the documents in 650's database since they're putting excellent legal minds to work curating and updating their documents and automations over time. When you're not billing by the hour, outsourcing and efficiency matters and 650 can help you scale your practice to get high quality documents drafted in less time. Use the code law subscribed at 650.com and would be an onboarded to get 10% off. If you're not a business and employment attorney, or you have your own documents that you'd prefer to use, then my next sponsor, Gavel, is the automation tool for you. Gavel allows you to build shareable, client-facing workflow and document automations. In other words, Gavel helps you create a legal practice where attorneys can monetize the value they bring clients in productized form at scale via subscriptions and flat fees. Use the code law subscribed at gavel.io to get 10% off an annual subscription. There's no one right way to automate and scale your practice, but with one or both of my sponsors, 650 and Gavel, you can take your subscription law firm to the next level. Links to both in the show notes. Now back to the show. One of my biggest takeaways, one of my biggest lessons and I, I may have mentioned this when I was interviewed on a podcast, but if my listeners like haven't heard that, I think it's important for me to say here and also for you too, is I used to have like limited amount of contracts or letters. So I, instead of saying documents, because I see on your website, you say document reviews. Yeah. I did contracts or letters and it's like, it's terminology. Like, I don't know like what they're going right. to, like, 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 you know, if I say, I thought about saying documents, but what if somebody's like, well, is a contract a document? Is a letter a document? So I was like, I'm going to do contract slash letter because... It's more wordy, which I hate. I mean, you have a very concise on your website, but I'm the same way, less is more. But then what I found is I ended up having to also do like a research project here and there. Not often, especially, oh. especially in, you know, in transactional yeah. and, and, and advising small mm -hmm. businesses, not, not as common. So then I came down to projects as the term X amount mm. of projects per month. That's because interesting. Of, so, so, and then I, and then in my, I updated my engagement agreement to define what a project is. 
Mm-hmm. And on my website, still, I do have in parentheses, like, what is a project? Like, I, I explain that in, in, one of the, in one of the parts of my website, right? A contract, a letter, you know, research. And, uh, and with Case Tax Co-Counsel, I mean, not right. sponsoring the podcast yet, but it, <laughs> and it's not, it's not always perfect. It's not always perfect. Prompting really matters with that stuff. You get totally right. different answers, but that does save so much time. Huge amount of time. So, so like I found that projects has been like a good term of art, if you will, for like, I the, like the, that. W- yeah, what, what they're able to get access to. Yeah. Huh. Okay. That's. So what was that just a trial and error thing or was that like you, you, you tried a couple of different things and then you decided that you needed to actually define a term and, and go from there? Well, I just had simply not contemplated doing research and I hadn't priced it out. I've completely, my, my model is I have some pure subscription plays and some subscription plus flat fee work, but it's right. always got a subscription. That's mm-hmm. how my engagement activates is they subscribe even at $20 a month. I, while I've unbundled all my other services that I offer and all those prices are on my website, I didn't unbundle research. Yeah. And so it's something I only offer to my pure subscription clients, which are business mm-hmm. level or above, I mean, essentially. Right. What I, I have yet to have a freelancer who's need, I've needed to do research for. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe I would. I mean, a lot of my thing is with, like you, you mentioned knowledge base, keyword, right? Mm-hmm. Like you keep a knowledge base. So hopefully you don't have to do a lot of research because clients could just go look at it or you could look at it. But, right. but I ended up having to do a little bit more research than I anticipated. And I, did, I wasn't comfortable because of the engagement agreement like billing more because I try to be, I've, I stated all my pricing is transparent. Right. So I recategorized the, like yeah. immediately effective the next month for that one client. <laughs> Pro- research is now included towards that X amount of things you get per month with your subscription. And it was just, yeah, it's just learning. It was like, well, they didn't even end up using the full amount of, of contract letters they had that month anyway, but had I categorized it for them, it would have blown way past it. <laughs> <laughs> for all the research I had to do. Right. So happy client. They're still subscribed. And because of that, it's now, it's just a lesson I learned with my client. And, but because I'm not billing my time or I'm not doing just flat fee work, mm-hmm. I feel like I didn't lose. I feel like I still made money. Well, right. And I adapted. I built the, I'm building the plane as I fly it 14 months in. And, and projects seem to work. And, and no one's asked me, well, what's a project? Because I, I clearly okay. define it. Yeah. Yeah. So just, yeah, cool. so hopefully you got something from this interview, Owen. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Let's talk. Some, some, interest, some other things that come up with having a subscription practice is the multi-jurisdictional problem. How do you handle multi-jurisdictional issues or like a client from California, a potential client reaches out and says, hey, I, your subscription pricing looks great. Can, can I hire you? Yeah, so I, I did a lot of research on this. And basically what I found is I can work with people in multiple jurisdictions so long as I have the competency on the law to do it. So if California came to me and said, hey, we've got a California law problem or a California employment law problem. Nope. Like I have, I mean, California employment law is its own beast, right? If they come to me and they say, we, we've got a basic, you know, you know, we would like to take you to, you to take a look at, you know, a shareholder agreement. Now, shareholder agreements, no matter the jurisdiction, are basically going to be the same. And so many companies are Delaware based anyway, that if you develop a competency in Delaware corporate law, then you can work with any number of people. I, I write into the engagement agreement that there, there, there will be certain aspects of representing companies outside of Pennsylvania, where I will have to decline certain types of work, you know, specifically things that are particular to any state's law. Right. I've yet to have anybody from Louisiana reach out. That might just be a hard no to begin with, simply because, you know, I, I have no idea about, you know, the, the old civil law remnants. But, but yeah, you know, I mean, Florida I, too. It, Florida, Florida is, yeah, you got to be careful with Florida in my experience. Yeah. 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 I, so, it, it's, it's hard that like that, that is one of the most difficult questions to answer because there's no clear answer. I mean, I wish. Right. I, yeah. I, I, you know, I mean, I, I, I did a bunch of, you know, looking into, you know, is it the unlicensed practice of law? And no, because I'm in Pennsylvania practicing law, right? If 
technically, if yes. Go, if if I go to court in that place, it would be on licensed practice of law. If I moved to California without getting barred in, in California, it would be the unlicensed practice of law. It comes to a malpractice issue and a competency issue more than the the license licensure issue. Right. And 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 I think that what the ABA Commission on Professionalism mm -hmm. or whichever ABA entity is, has proposed the new model rule for whichever yeah. model rule that is, I can't remember off the top of my head, that's essentially what they're, they want to codify, is mm -hmm. saying as long as you don't go to court and you tell your client, I'm not, I'm not licensed to go to court in your jurisdiction, you know, so you could always still hire a licensed attorney right. in your jurisdiction, as long as you consent to that, that's okay. So it sounds like you're kind of already pilot programming what the ABA mm -hmm. is soon hopefully to recommend. And yeah. it's not that, but because it's simply not clear. It's, it's, it's not clear, you know, but, you know, if we wait for the bar associations and the disciplinary committees to give us permission, we're going to be waiting for 200 more years. Yeah. I mean, it's just simply how the world works now, right? Right. It, it's the gray zone and it's not explicitly unethical. If it was, you know, attorneys wouldn't do it. Right. So many attorneys do it. And so it's because it's simply unclear. It's just don't cross a line. Don't be, don't practice in a law that you're not competent to practice, you know, if you don't know it and, and just, you know, if you do good work too, no one's going to, you know, practically well, I, speaking, I mean, I mean, you know, that's the thing, you know, and I mean, most attorneys are in fact ethical, right? I mean, right. there's, there's, there's the whole, you know, joke, you know, kind of stuff, but most of us have, have a pretty good idea of, oh man, I shouldn't do this. Hey, I, I don't know enough about this to, to really to do it. You, you get that sort of like antsy feeling, right? Right. Uh, you know, but you know, most of the, most of the, especially in corporate work, you know, or transactional work, that's fairly routine across the country at this point. I mean, it's, it's developed its own, you know, language and it's not going to be fundamentally different anywhere except perhaps Louisiana or Florida. Right. And I'm never taking another bar exam. No, no, no. One, once was enough. So, something else that, that you mentioned early in the, in the conversation that I wanted to bring it back to is you, you talked about how you can all of a sudden be so deep in on a project and before you know it, like the whole day has gone by. And I guess usually when people think of ADHD, they think of the opposite, but that is in fact, I believe, an accurate representation of what that right. could represent. But it also makes me think of flow state. Mm -hmm. And I had a, I, I, I get a, I, you probably get pitched all the time too on LinkedIn by performance coaches, right? Of like, oh, yeah. hey, we could help you de-stress. It's like, I'm not building my time. I'm not stressed. So you know, there's, there's other stresses, but it's, right. yeah, it's significantly less. So I, but, but one guy talked about conscious flow control and I had him on the podcast mm -hmm. to talk about it because it was so interesting. And I like, I like, there's, there's a way I, I highly recommend you listen, you know, listeners go back and listen yeah. to it. People have skipped over because it's not about subscription legal services, and this is what this podcast is about. But I think it's related to performance mm -hmm. and and getting into that state of flow, positive and negative, yeah. and being able to get out of it. Like like there's there, and even though he hasn't coached me, just interviewing him on the podcast yeah. made me consciously think about okay, I got to get out of this flow state. Yeah, you know, I might not be doing it the way Clay Clay will teach you, but but even just thinking about it has helped because that sounds like flow state to me. Yeah, you know, I mean, ADHD, the, the, we have this notion of, you know, little boys who can't focus on anything, right? ADHD is a dysregulation of function, of, of focus, meaning, you know, when you're a little kid, it could be, you know, you can't, you know, look at one thing for, you know, 10 seconds or more. But the other end of it is a hyper focus, right? Where you get so lost in something that time just disappears. So, you know, there are a lot of alarms that I have going off. My 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 dog, I think, is sometimes shocked by the, the constant, <laughs> you know, alarm bells going. But I wonder what kind of Pavlovian responses your dog has to this to all those alarms yeah, going off. I yeah, time. Yeah. I I mean, time blocking is is how I I take you know take care of that. I try to take care of that that way. So just some some last things that we'll hit and then we'll wrap up here. When you built this, were you thinking about access to justice or serving the latent legal market, or has it been a sort of consequence of just the prices and the efficiencies that you've built. Yeah, no, I mean, that that was definitely something that was top of mind, right? I mean, it would have been perfectly sensible uh, just on a purely monetary standpoint to keep doing the higher level subscriptions for companies that are scale up rather than startup, right? I can make enough money to live doing that. 
I kept seeing companies that I thought were really promising that weren't getting the help they needed and, and not working. And they weren't working because they couldn't afford to hire somebody to, to really do the work and help them. And I wanted to, to provide, you know, not, not just like legal zoom kind of stuff, but actual, you know, person who is not just a, an attorney, but also a business person and, and knows the sort of the market and the way that, that things work. It's, it's amazing, you know, how comforting it is just to have somebody who, you know, that you can call and say, I've got this problem. Right. So, yeah, I mean, part of what I was trying to solve for was this whole group of startup founders who didn't have access to the help that they really need. You say you don't want to be just like LegalZoom, although you kind of are because your law firm.com slash products, you have products on your you website for, for flat fees. So, so you are, you, you know, you're, you're doing what LegalZoom is doing, which is, I think, like living the dream, right? Now, if, I, if it were me, I'd make them pay a subscription to get a discount on those flat fee prices. So, so the, the seed council members get a discount on those flat fee prices. There you go. All right. They're excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's part of the value of the subscription. So it's like, what are they getting? This is what, it, for, for me, like this is what that ethics opinion was missing from the ABA was it's mm -hmm. like, well, what are they getting for their payment? Does a law firm just sell legal services and that's it? What if they sell products? Right. So, what? you know, this is a discussion that I, that I have with friends of mine who are in big law, right? I tell them that their entire business model is you, you hire a bunch of associates and you put their hours in a warehouse and you sell the hours, right? But you need a person to show up and fill those hours every time. I'm trying to build assets, mm -hmm. right? You know, one of the things that I'm doing at Seed Council is I've got for a bunch of different things, sort of three tiers of, of product, right? If you want to trademark, right? Here's a $350 point by point checklist showing you how to do it. There's a thousand dollar version where, you know, you take a look at that checklist and you say, that seems like a lot of, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do that properly. You fill out the forms, we'll review them, make sure that they're correct, and then we'll file them. And then there's a $2,500 version that is, I don't want to do this at all. You take care of it and we'll take care of everything. And I've had, my big law friends say, why are you offering the $350? You know, you're not, you're not going to make a lot of money on that. And I said, I'm going to make a ton of money on that because I make it once. And then I just hit repeat on the cash coming through every time somebody buys it. I would rather have that asset built and sold over and over and over again, because I don't have to do anything more for it. Right. Right. I've, I've, and, and so like for, for your things, you know, like you clearly state, you know, Delaware company, Pennsylvania company, mm -hmm. uh, but I, and it's part of your law firm, clearly. I've also seen a law firm spin off a separate company, a la Hello Divorce, where right. then now all of a sudden anyone could do it because it's definitely not legal services because it's not even attached to a law firm. I think that, you know, it's questionable whether a law firm needs to do that. Maybe there's a good reason for tax purposes. I don't know. It certainly opens up the market. But then again, like you said, you know, you're still going to, there's still plenty of people who want to file in Delaware or Pennsylvania that you're going to make sufficient funds for your yeah. firm and for your, your lifestyle. Yeah. It is, uh, are you a true solo or do you have staff or are you thinking about growing your firm? So the business firm is the true solo. Well, I guess that's not entirely true. My, my dad, I retired from big law a bunch of, several years ago. And my mom called me right when I was open my firm and said, do you need help? I said, thank you for that vote of confidence. And she said, no, you don't understand. Your dad's driving me crazy. I need him to have something to do. So my, my dad does technically work at the firm. He works, you know, five hours a month, something like that. He's, he's somebody that I can call up and run ideas past and stuff like that. So I'm, I'm not truly solo, but pretty close. close. Yeah, pretty close. So are you thinking about growing it in the future? Or is this, are you like lifestyle business and this is good enough for you? So I do plan on growing it, but I don't plan on building an empire, right? That doesn't have a whole lot of interest to me, but I would like to, to build C council to, to scale such that I can hire another attorney to, to run it, you know, and, and build it out that way so that, you know, the, that entry level work 
you know, gets a really good attorney to work on it. And then I can focus more on the higher level subscriptions. And, and there are a bunch of companies that, that I've taken equity in that I want to attend to as well. And, you know, unlike McGran Law, Seed Council yeah. is a brand. And there's a reason. There's a reason for that. And yeah. you're, you're pointing out exactly why. Yep. Here's a brand, a subscription for predictable revenue. So if some big law firm comes a knock in in the future, mm -hmm. hey, hey, or if, you know, you know, Deloitte in Arizona operating a law firm comes a knock in, That's right. right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, the, the, the reason for seed council rather than just a, a, a another offering of McGrand Law was I wanted to get it so that my name wasn't there and that eventually, you know, when you sign up for it, people don't expect to work directly with me. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's wise. My last question for you of substance is most of the lawyers I've interviewed on this podcast who are using the subscription model are women, attorneys of color. And so there's very few white men like us. I'm trying to figure out you know, maybe what's made us different, but I think you were usually first generation attorney that doesn't apply to you, but, or neurodiverse or some combination. But also, I mean, the reason why I think non-white men are doing innovative things is because like the ABA data on the profession has shown, yeah, it doesn't work for them. They, it's, you know, it's, not, it's not built for anybody, but people who look like us. Yeah. Right. So, so yeah. So I just, I want to get your thoughts on like why that is. I mean, obviously it's not good. It's not like good that... It's like that. So let's, uh, we have that assumption, but why do you think it is that there, that, you know, the women and, and people of color attorneys are the ones innovating in the space and why, and, and for everyone else, like it, this is also your opportunity to say why it's great. Like why every lawyer needs to abandon the billable hour. Yeah. You know, I mean, I don't think that it's difficult to understand why big law hasn't yet. Right. It is still massively profitable for them. Right. For the, you know, 5% of attorneys who are equity partners at those firms at the top of that, you know, pyramid scheme, they're doing really well, right? They have no incentive to change and they've got the voting rights to change it or not change it until their clients come to them and say, Hey, I'd like a little bit more, you know, price certainty or, you know, I've got this, this other firm over here is selling me a, a flat fee for the work they, that, you know, you, you charge me a different amount for every single time what's going on, there's going to be no movement from big law. But mm -hmm. it's always been the case that real innovation and change comes from smaller firms and, and solos. And I think that it's the case that for, for a, a bunch of reasons, solo and small firms have a far, far higher proportion of, of women and, and you know, non-white men Partially because they look at the big firms that are run by old white men and they say, fuck no, I don't want any part of this. And it's more than simply that those firms are, you know, often not welcoming. It's that, you know, firms are, those big firms aren't built for mothers. They're not built for people who are not, you know, willing to, to work 90 hours a week and, and, you know, never show up to, you know, their kids, you know, sporting events or take care of their parents when they're old and ill. And so you get a sort of self-selecting group saying, I don't want any part of that. And they don't have the incentive to build the same thing for themselves, right? They get out there and they say, how can I build a firm that serves my life rather than me serving the firm? Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think that's part of the reason that you see just this fundamental difference of, of perspective is because once you get out of that totalizing world of, of big law, you start thinking about how do I build something that serves me, right, in my life and the things that I care about, rather than inverting that and, and effectively indenturing yourself to, to the firm that you work for. And, yes, and, maybe my interest of serving me is, and my interests are similar to other people who are like me, right? right? Or in the same communities as me right. who maybe aren't getting legal services. That's right. Right. You know, but I, I think that, you know, the, the less that you are brought up in, in that sort of group think of, of what law has traditionally been, you know, the easier it is to, to recognize that 
is insane. And that there are other ways to do it. There, there's nothing like, you know, there aren't, you know, stones that, that came down from Mount Sinai or wherever, you know, with thou shalt bill by the hour. <laughs> you know, they, the bill of is actually relatively new as mm -hmm. far as it goes. Mm -hmm. There are all kinds of different ways to set up a business. You know, I, I, I hope that more people start thinking about these different models because, you know, it leads to just a much better life. And, and I mean, you only get one of these. So you want to be tracking your time that whole time? <laughs> right. I think so. You know, I, I mean, I, there, there were, there was a moment I was about six years into practice and I took my dog for a walk in the morning and I went for a longer walk than usual. And towards the end of it, I started thinking, this is a really expensive walk. That's got to be about a point three. And I knew at that moment that I was well and truly screwed, mm -hmm. right? Because I could only think of value in terms of time spent doing something. And when you start recalibrating just your, your the, the way that you view your own ontology, right? Your being as, as being predicated on the time that you spend doing something, right? No wonder people don't want to go to their kids, you know, sports games because you're not making proper use of your productivity. You know, you're not, you're not maximizing the money that you can make if you do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's no way to live. Yeah. Ag agreed. Agreed. So we don't. So we don't live that way. More of the story. That's right. I mean, I mean, I mean the, 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 the shocking thing is you can opt out of that, right? You don't have to do it. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so the reason why everybody listens to the end of the episode is because of my shocking last question, Owen, which is, is a hot dog a sandwich and why? You know, I think that ultimately this is a, a, a distinction without a difference. Mm -hmm. Still got to answer. Uh, I'm going to go with no. Because? Under under the understanding, it's a distinction without a difference. Just what's your reasoning right, so, for the no? So a sandwich has multiple pieces of bread, whereas a bun is one piece that is sliced in the middle. So therefore, my distinction is that a sandwich requires two slices of bread, whereas a bun is a single thing with a pocket in it. Begs the question, is an open-faced sandwich with just one slice of bread so, a sandwich? So that I, I guess not. Misnomer, then? <laughs> that, that is a misnomer. <laughs> okay, at least, not... <laughs> logically consistent. At least you're logically consistent. Okay. We call things things they aren't all the time in the English language. So, you know. English gives, language gives itself away so often, but... All right. Well, well, thanks again. We already talked about you're active on LinkedIn. So obviously can, people can connect with you on LinkedIn, but what's some other ways that they can reach out? Yeah. So, I mean, LinkedIn is probably the easiest. It's the only social media I really use, but you can find me at ccouncil.io or mygrandlaw.com. And then my email is owen at both of those. So if you want to reach out, I'd be happy to hear from you. Great. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks again to 650 and Gavel for sponsoring this show. The best way for others to discover this show is for you to share it with someone you think would find a value from it. Follow me on LinkedIn since that's where I'm most active on social media and click the bell towards the top right of my profile to get notified about all of my posts about this podcast and everything else I think is valuable for you to see. To get in touch, Message me on LinkedIn or email Kerbis at lawsubscribed.com. All links are in the show notes. Until next time, this is Matthew Kerbis with Law Subscribed. <laughs>